Ladies and gentlemen, members of the press, welcome to another episode of the Live Painting Channel. Yep, we're doing it again. Every Sunday at 11 a.m. Pacific Time. Feel free to uh, chat along in the chat box, and very importantly, hopefully you brought your paints and your painting gear, and you can paint along. I'm going to do a little bit different format today in terms of uh, just the, the show's program. I'm going to uh, provide a little bit of art instruction. Focus more on the beginning painter or the beginning artist. We'll get plenty of advanced stuff as we go as well. But uh, I would just kind of share with you my thinking in terms of the process of creating a painting. Or actually any work of art, but a painting uh, is what we're up to today. First, think about it. Ask the person next to you, what's the first thing you do when you're going to start a painting? Go ahead, ask them. Some people will say, well, get buy a canvas or get, get something to paint on. Good point. Get your art supplies ready. Good point as well. However, what I like to think of is starting with something that's inspiring. So you start with inspiration, number one. So get something that inspires you. I often use photos from places I've visited or things I've done, vacations I've been on, things like that. Sometimes it's uh, from sketches that I've done on site. And today my inspiration is a visit that I made recently to uh, Palm Desert and go down there quite often, usually about once a year, kind of get out of the rain and snow and whatnot in Seattle. And we ran across a really cool thing in Desert Hot Springs. Uh, Desert Hot Springs is north of Palm Springs. And uh, it's kind of like about halfway to uh, Joshua Tree from Palm Springs. And we found this, kind of synchronistically found this little uh, uh, attraction, which was called Cabot's Pueblo. And a really cool thing. Uh, it's a Pueblo, well, it's actually what I would call a large adobe structure, or several large adobe structures, but he calls it a Pueblo. It started in 1913, took him many years to complete. Kind of reminds me of the, the Winchester Mystery House of uh, California in San Jose. And that what he did was built it over a period of many years and just kept adding and adding rooms and parts of the structure and adding on. And um, ended up with, I think it was 51 or 54 rooms in this, in this big sprawling adobe uh, Pueblo, he calls it. Striking uh, image for me, and it was a beautiful day in the desert. Blue sky, some puffy clouds, and the structure itself is what I wanted to uh, basically work on today. So we all start with inspiration. The next thing we want to do is think about composition. So composition is important. First, you have to determine the size and ratio of the canvas or the material you're working on. Some people, by the way, uh, let me sh share a little bit about some of the basic stuff about things you can paint on. You can paint on just about anything. I've painted on cardboard, masonite. Um, I currently use canvases that I kind of custom create, modify from the store-bought version. But these are great canvases here. These, these are just really thin, flat canvases. They do have a canvas surface. This brand is uh, the Artist's Loft. Loft, no product placements here. But uh, you get these at places like Michael's or um, Another great place to buy stuff like this is Daniel's uh, Art Supply, uh, regional Northwest art store and catalog. But uh, whatever it is, you choose your material, your, your, uh, your medium, and decide what dimensions you're going to use. Now, I've used recently used um, square canvases. I don't usually use square canvases, but I, I did a fun one. Here, I'll show it to you. The last painting we did here on the show was done on a square canvas and turned out really it was a lot of fun to do this one this is a, a painting of a uh, one of my inspiring artists that I follow a guy named Bill Saunders and uh, it's basically a uh, painting of an outdoor scene and but the cool thing was it was a square canvas but I tried to really keep it from being too symmetrical got all kinds of fun stuff in it including a little man walking the dog in there I think that was Amber my daughter's suggestion you know, I do take suggestions as we paint, but it had some nice mountains and a little bit different sky than I usually paint. Had a lot of fun. Anyway, the point is, is that you start with, you know, your, your canvas size. So you could use square, rectangle. What I do is I use 
some proportions that are they're pretty cool. Um, they're based on the concepts of dynamic symmetry. If you've never heard of it, you can uh, pick up a book called The Elements of Dynam Dynamic Symmetry. The author is Jay Hambidge. I believe it was originally published in 1926, but it's still got great material in it. And it talks about constructing um, rectangles to what's called the golden mean or the golden rectangle proportions. There's not just one of them, there's a whole series of them. But the uh, most famous is the one I use a lot, and it's called the golden rectangle. And what that means is that the dimensions, the height and the width of the painting, are based on a proportion that roughly equals 1.618. What that means is you have, if this was 1, this would be 1.618. So it's a ratio. If this were 10 inches across the top, this would be 16.18 inches, and so on. What an interesting thing starts to occur with this rectangle, and it typically a way to look at it is start with the main diagonals of the rectangle, which are which are basically the point to point from the far sides of each corner of the rectangle, and then the right angle to that rectangle. Now you might not be able to see it, so I'm going to highlight this a little bit. The main diagonal comes say down like this. The right angle to that comes in here. I'll just draw it in a little bit more. And what that creates is, first of all, where that intersects down in here on the side, it creates another rectangle of the same proportions here and a square across the bottom, if you're following that. Right, and uh, I, I do want to take a moment, I'm going to just pause and take a moment to uh, share with everybody in the audience and who might view this on uh, YouTube later, is that uh, this marks a very um, critical time in the, in the, I think, the history of the world. And as, as you all know, if you're part of this program, is that we have a, a pandemic going on. So um, one of the things that I'd like to do is just have a space where people can just sort of have fun, do something that's fun and creative, uh, and still keep your social distance. And there's no better way to do that than something online, right? And something creative. Just get your mind off the news. I mean, turn turn off the TV. Turn off your you know your podcast and all this, and just have fun here. And my my hearts and thoughts go out to all the families that are uh, have been affected and people that that they may know or close to them that uh, that have uh, been affected by this. But today we're just going to try to focus on uh, positive energy and see if we can project some of that into the world. So we're going to create a painting here. And we start by inspiration, then composition. And I've just laid out some lines here, which I've been talking about here. You can see the, the diagonal to the main that I just drew and so on. And uh, once you've got your composition basically established, which basically tells you where you want to put the elements of the painting, then you think about light and dark. Not color yet. You don't think about color right off the bat. You think light and dark areas. So in this case, I've got those uh, chosen in my painting. Uh, there's light and dark. And you also have to, when you're thinking of light and dark, uh, choose the direction of light if you're working from an existing photo or something that you're painting in uh, in, in real time there's always a, a, a source of light and in this case the lights coming from high in the sky from the upper right down to the lower right and it's creating some very nice lights and darks as you'll see you don't see the lights and darks yet but we're going to start with those here very shortly so inspiration composition light and dark then color but an important thing if you're working in something like a landscape or even an architectural scene like this, that you need to think about starting from the back of the painting, what's farthest away first, and then work forward. And as you paint or try these things, you'll, you'll find out why. It just works because the painting is going to be kind of layered in these depths here. And one thing I like to do with paintings is to use things that sort of draw the eye into it and thus the compositional lines. And I just kind of got lucky with this one in that the image that I'm working with fit nicely into these 
some of these verticals, horizontals, and diagonals that just basically matched up to these golden, what are called golden proportions, which are the intersections on the special rectangle and then creating verticals, horizontals, and other diagonals from it. Hopefully that makes some sense to you all. So as I said, we're going we're gonna to think light and dark, but I'm going to start with the sky area that, that falls right in this area on the back here. Now, now we can think color. I've been using uh, uh, different sorts of blues depending on the painting, uh, blue pigments. There's a couple of my favorites are uh, thalo blue, which is a really bright, cheery blue. There's an ultramarine blue that I've used recently in paintings. In fact, on the last painting I just showed you, that is more of a kind of almost, if you, if you really stare at it for a while, it almost has a violet uh, hue to it called ultramarine blue. It works good for what I think are good desert scenes, but we're going to go with a very bright, cheery blue, and, and we're going to put some white puffy clouds in here. And these clouds are going to live up in here. And guess what? They're going to be placed, not so much like the photo or what I saw exactly, but they're going to be placed so that they kind of um, follow these diagonals as they intersect and create a very, I think, a very interesting uh, dynamic to it. So when you're thinking color, one of the key things is palette. Now, you don't have to do what I've done to, for this painting, which is to create some studies of color before I start. But I do want to share with the audience uh, what I mean by that. So I do what I call swatches, color swatches. For example, here are some swatches of, I'm trying to, trying to get some browns and neutral tones that I like. And a little tip for uh, beginning artists is don't, don't to use too many pigments in a painting, typically. Uh, and certainly um, in a particular area of the painting. So what I've been working on is some browns because the structure itself is all very interesting earth tones, adobe, you know, brick and, and mud and, and earth tones. And the sand and stuff that's in the foreground is all that, is various forms of earth tones. So what I do is I just take and I put some of the raw color on the top usually, and then I gradate it down by adding bits of white, uh, increments of white, and then I might take a couple of different pigments, usually not more than two, plus white. For example, in this corner, I've got uh, raw umber and Naples yellow. Up here, I've just got raw umber and white. Here, I've got um, raw sienna and white gradating. And it just gives you the ability to keep some very nice um, palette control and also to study the colors before you actually get started. Here's another uh, work on that. Burnt Sienna and Naples yellow and white. So I wanted. I saw that the bricks and the, the adobe structure had had kind of a yellowish um, tint to the brown. So I started working with this, and I really liked the one on the far right that says it's raw umber, color called bronze yellow and white. So some of my uh, bricks and such will be kind of in that um, in that mix. But again, helps to think about your your colors before you get started, and I think you'll have a lot more fun that way. For the blue, I've got a very basic uh, palette here that I've started, we're gonna work in right now. It's just a bunch of uh, thalo blue, a little bit of Payne's gray to what I call neutralize it. Very seldom do you see absolutely pure colors in nature. I guess it's very possible, but more often than not, it's subdued a little bit. And then plenty of white, always have plenty of white on your palette and on hand. I use titanium white usually. So that's the palette. So we're going to go ahead and get started with the blue. Um, remember, we're thinking as we do the colors, we're thinking light and dark as well. So the light will be the areas of cloud. The darker will be the blue. Uh, another little tip, especially for beginning painters and if you're painting some kind of a landscape, is that the sky tends to be lighter at the bottom, lighter by adding white, and then a little darker as you go up. And I think if you kind of follow that pattern, you'll, uh, you'll be pleased with it. And, and by the way, feel free to chat along, make suggestions, comments, what have you. Every once in a while I get a request to add something to a painting or maybe do a painting on a certain topic. Uh, so feel free. And hopefully you're getting your paints ready and we're going we're gonna to rock and roll here. And by the way, if you're just joining us, uh, you've joined the live painting channel, another episode. It's about month 15 into the program. We broadcast every Sunday at 11 a.m. Pacific time. 
and you're welcome to join anytime. There's no cost. It's just a place to hang out, and have fun. You can chat with your friends on the on the in the in the chat board there and see a lot of different dialogue going on, not just about the show. But I'm going to point my close-up cam up a little bit, and we're just going to start some painting here. Another little tip: have plenty. Of, if you're using acrylics, have plenty of water. Uh, I usually have at least two quarts or two jugs of water that I'm using because you don't want to have your um, the, the water that you're cleaning your brushes with get kind of polluted by all some mix of colors. If it looks like mud, you know, switch the water. <laughs> That's the general idea. So I'm just going to start mixing up some white and blue here and adding as I go a little bit of Payne's Gray to it. There we go. Nice blue, huh? I told you it was going to be fun. Oh, yeah. I love blue. I think there's an old song that says something like deep greens and blues are the colors I choose. And I use a lot of these. But today we're going to add a lot of neutral tones to the painting. So I'm just going to mix a little bit of thallow blue, white, and a tiny touch of Payne's Gray. Why don't we just start painting here? All right. I usually paint the top edges and the side edges, thanks to my daughter Amber, who taught me that. And I'm self-frames when you do that. Remember what I'm doing is the, where I'm putting these colors is actually, loosely speaking, following the, uh, some of these diagonals and shapes that the diagonals make when they intersect. And you can do whatever you want, because it's your world, of course. Your painting, but that's how I do it. Ah, wow, already having fun. Look at that. And so as I go down in the painting here with this blue, I'm going to add a little white to my to my palette. We'll we'll uh, kind of blend them in here a little bit here in a while. Why don't we make that go down right in there? How about that right in there all right now don't get don't stress out over over the start of the painting just start painting getting some paint on your canvas is what you want to do here you can stress out over stuff later today's session and the live painting show is about the opposite of stress it's about relaxation it's about having fun there is no stress today it's all good. We will survive. All right. Now in this case, I'm just sort of leaving my my areas for the, the structure and maybe another cloud or two. But remember, as I go down in the sky, I'm going to keep adding a little bit of white and get lighter as we go. I'm not quite sure what's going to happen with these cloud formations, but I'm kind of digging it right now. Simple. Little clouds. Happy, happy, happy clouds. <laughs> People often tease me about, hey, do you make happy trees in your paintings? And I guess sometimes I do. Yeah, you will all recognize what I mean by that. It's Bob Ross who really popularized live painting on television. He did over 30,000 paintings in his career, Bob Ross. Yes, and he is a uh, mentor in a way of mine. I've never met him personally. He passed away, but he sure he was a prolific painter. 30,000 paintings in his lifetime, in his career. Pretty amazing. I haven't got quite that many, but we've produced about, uh, oh, about 30 or so paintings on the show here. I do sell paintings from time to time. I'll give them away occasionally and, you know, just gift them to people. If you know anyone that needs a painting, let me know. I'm easy to find. The whole program's easy to find. You can, you can find the videos of all these live shows on YouTube and Facebook. You just, and uh, Twitch, by the way. Twitch is our broadcast uh, platform. You just look, you just search for Live Painting Channel. You'll find us. Lots of fun videos to watch. In fact, one of the most popular videos that, that I see the YouTube views on is the uh, one I, the first one in my Joshua Tree series. 
Maybe we'll resurrect that one sometime soon. But see what I'm doing is I'm just basically putting in, in this case, the dark. We talk light and dark. So I've got a nice, nice little set of structure of light and dark. And we're working on essentially for the top half of the painting, the dark part of it. And it's not that dark, but it can be much darker than those clouds. And it can be darker than the the uh, the adobe that's facing the light. Now I might just start with it kind of blending a little bit. I'm using a, just a half inch uh, chisel brush here, pretty soft bristles. And I'm just blending a bit here and there. Zoom in a bit more on that. Now when it comes to areas like where you want to have a pretty sharp edge, you've got your choice here of ways to deal with that. One is if you're if you're you know sure-handed, you can just uh, freehand those straight edges in. And in this case, this, the edges of these adobe structures aren't crisp all that crisp anyway. They kind of crumble around the edges and stuff. So I'm not too worried about it. There's a little area where it's not quite perfect line. And we got that one. Let this edge come down just a bit more. Now, another aspect, especially if you've got anything man-made in a painting like a, a building here, another aspect is the um, what's what's called the uh, the vanishing point, and it has to do with the um, how objects appear to um, get smaller in the distance, and um, if it's a rectilinear structure like this tower here. If you're near the bottom of it, you don't really see it too much here, I don't think, but the bottom of this is a little wider than the top, and so they tend to get you know narrower as they go. So it's called perspective. Another thing to keep in mind, especially like I say, if you're painting uh, painting man-made structures, but even like, let's say you're doing a painting and it's got a lot of similar trees in it, the farther away they are, the smaller they get, and that also helps the eye sort of believe the painting, right? The depth of the painting. And it is, in my world, I like to create depth so that the eye has a tendency to kind of come into the painting here. But you know, I think we about got that part of it um, licked here. I'm gonna clean out my brush here for a second. And uh, this is fun already. Man, I love these shows, we have a lot of fun. Just kind of creating my my world here. You can see the sky coming together. Ooh, that's going to be pretty. I know a guy at work, his name's Barry, maybe he's on the program, I don't know, today. He says he's he wants to paint. I don't think he's ever done a painting, but he told me he wants to paint huge paintings. Like I said, how huge? He says like, you know, 12 feet by 20 feet. That would be one big painting, basically a mural, I guess, perhaps. I don't even know if you can stretch a canvas that big, but he said he wants to paint like really angry colors. So, okay, well, that's fine for you, but I'm going with the peaceful colors, mostly. Things that are fun and peaceful. So now um, we could work on the sky a little bit more, but this is a, kind of breaking my own rule. I'm not going to finish the sky because there's a really nice um, delineation of where the sky meets the objects in the next layer, which in this case is all this part of this big adobe structure. So I'm just going to switch gears and we're going to start laying in some light and dark on that using color. And remembering my swatches, I do have to... Uh, Get a little bit of bronze yellow on my on my neutral palette here. And then we'll be ready to start that. This palette is a little more, um, I guess, complicated in that it has quite a few more colors, pigments. This palette has the main browns are the raw umber, the raw sienna, 
and the burnt sienna. Those are my browns. Raw umber is really dark brown, basically. And then the lighter one of these is the uh, raw sienna, and then burnt sienna has kind of a reddish look to it. And it's you can, of course, buy them at any store. But I've added Naples yellow, which is a nice sort of a neutral yellow, into the palette. Plenty of white. Notice, too, how I put little uh, blobs of white in the wells near the other piece, uh, pieces of or areas of pigment. That's so I don't I can blend white without you know mixing the pigments together. And then over here in this corner I have this bronze yellow. And I really liked that when I mixed it in with what was it? I'll have to refer to my swatch. I mixed that with uh, oh yeah. There we go. So I'm gonna remind you about the swatches in case you didn't see that part. I have these swatches I've been working on for this painting. And we're talking about the raw umber mixed with bronze, yellow, and white. I made a really nice earth tone that, that uh, just kind of fit what I had in my mind's eye. Uh, feel free to ask questions uh, in the audience today. I got a question. Uh, when I was in Mexico, did I ever work on Adobe buildings? Well, I never built any, that's for darn sure. Uh, interesting question. But in terms of painting, um, not so much. In Mexico, I did a lot of just outdoor uh, scenes, some from like parts of the city. That Basically, I, when I was in Mexico, I was earning a living, literally, by my art. It's one of the two times in my life where my art, my paintings were my source of income. A little sidebar story on that. Down in Mexico, uh, I was down there in the... Uh, 79, 80 time frame. We actually sailed a boat that we built in Oregon, long story, uh, but ended up in central Mexico, or along the coast of Mexico. Um, but one of, the, one of the places that we visited and spent a fair amount of time in and out of was Puerto Vallarta. And there's this wonderful church there that's just a fantastic structure. And so what I would do is paint pictures of, paint paintings of things, usually watercolors, maybe a little pen and ink, of things that the tourists would visit because they became easier to sell. So they would have a little memento um, painting of, of what they saw when they were touring around Mexico. So I did the church, the, the church there quite a bit and some other buildings. But the funny thing about my, uh, my, uh, art, my art career in Mexico was that I took a different strategy. Um, the Mexicans, all certainly good, talented artists, dozens of them in the you know, street vendors out there selling paintings, and they would sell them super cheap like two or three hundred pesos, which was about, you know, it's literally like, you know, three bucks or something. You could buy a, a original art. But I just decided I wanted to differentiate myself. So I charged a ridiculously high price for mine, a thousand pesos instead of 200, for example. That was $50 at the time. Now, I could live like a king in Mexico for $50 US, a thousand pesos a day, which we, we did very well. And so I would basically just sometimes ride the tour boat or just sit in town and do my paintings and as, as I did it uh, people would come up and they'd look at all the different art and I sold my fair share of these. Why? Because I think that uh, because I charged so much more people probably thought it must be better art or worth more. That's kind of funny. Worked out great. So anyway I better get painting here. Too much storytelling and we won't have enough painting. I try to finish these paintings in about two sessions. Occasionally it'll take three so think of these paintings as taking anywhere from one to three hours. That should be plenty to do an acrylic painting. That, a lot that, and you know those are those are fun times. So I'm going to go ahead and mix up my lights here, referring back to my swatches. It's surprisingly difficult, at least for me, to to really nail the colors. You have to work with your pigments. And then you have to kind of go back and forth and like I was using those swatches to kind of experiment with. But I've got this one that I have that I'm working on right now. It's just the raw umber, a little bit of that gold kind of yellow. It's called bronze yellow and white. And I've noticed too, especially for beginning beginner painters, that uh, when you mix it on the palette, it, it looks differently on the it looks different on the canvas, which is why swatches are a good idea. But I'm just going to dive in and we're going to put in, using a little smaller brush here, by the way. This one's about a 3 8 inch chisel, br chisel brush. 
meaning that it's flat on the end, but it has a little bit of angle to it in terms of how the brush is cut, the bristles are cut. And we're just going to start right in this area here. And I'm just going to draw this down, this one vertical. Just one nice big stroke there. Yeah, I like it, but I think I want a little more white. Like I was saying, it always looks a little different when you do it on canvas. You got to keep your uh, brush wet, but not dripping. So, and then you use these little in these um, very inexpensive palettes. They're like a dollar a piece or whatever plastic palettes. You have these little wells of areas where you can kind of mix because you got to mix enough to make make the part of the painting you're working on. Let me try adding a little white to that. There we go. There we go. That's the color I want right there. And I'm not being too worried about the windows and stuff. They're just I'm just kind of roughly blocking out the area uh, for them as I go. I sketched this one with colored pencil in kind of a brown, brownish red colored pencil, but you, know, you don't have to you don't have to draw the image first if you don't want i find with architecture i almost have to though a lot of times with landscapes it, you know brushes work better than drawing anyway when you start the painting all right uh-huh sweet Uh, no painter would be a real artist unless they got paint on their hands, by the way, so. And I've got paint, my painting clothes that, I got four or five shirts and stuff that even my pants somehow get paint on them. <laughs> I don't know how that happens, but it seems like everything I wear when I'm painting gets a little bit of paint on it. So part of my tips is don't wear your Sunday's best uh, clothes uh, if you're going to be painting. Do something that you don't mind getting paint on. Another little tip there for you. And by the way, I have my reference image over here. My reference image is a photo I took on my iPhone of that of that place, and I have it on my uh, my iPad. Another little tip is I have a little music stand that holds a book or things like your iPad. Can't really see that too well. Maybe I'll get the close-up cam on it here in a minute. But in any event, the point is I have some my reference uh, reference photo there that I'm kind of working from. Not trying to make a photo of this. Sorry about the camera jiggling there. There we go. Let me see if I can get that close-up cam to take a look at that iPad. Yeah, there we go. You see what I'm talking about. There's the clouds and there's the Adobe. Cool. All right, let's get back, get those cameras back. Camera crew, get over here. All right, sir. Don't digress too much here. All right, so we're working on the main tower here. Just reading the chats coming in. All right. I'm going to back the camera up a little bit as we go down the, the painting here. Hey, I'll share with the, the folks on the 
program today, a little, little trick. For straight lines, you could, you could use a straight edge or something, but here's something that works really well. Take a piece of masking tape. Special art tape works best, but really any masking tape will do. And if you want a straight line, make sure there's no wet paint on there where I put that masking tape. Check this out though. Now I get my pigment. I just paint right over the tape. And it will make a nice straight line out of that. So you can take the tape off whenever you want. There you go. Nice straight line. Pretty cool, huh? Kind of obvious, but a little tip. Okay, now I'm going to take this same light colored uh, earth tone and I'm going to put it in this other, other parts of the building that have the same, basically the same light falling on them or shining on them. So I got one right here. Got another one right here. When I say another one, I'm talking about these surfaces all at the same angle to the sun, and the sun is shining on them pretty much with the same hue there. Another tip for beginners is just do it. Just start doing it. Just get out there and start painting. And this is a great venue to do it. Kind of maybe co-inspiring when you get uh, get on the live painting show and you can paint your own thing. Amaze your friends with all the progress you've made. Become a famous rich artist. Ha ha ha. I think the term rich artist is kind of an oxymoron, sort of like military intelligence or one of those. Rich artist, huh? I'm not even sure that I've ever met one of those. Rich in spirit, maybe. Okay. I've got another one of these here, these areas that are... Remember, these are all in the same plane, if you know what I mean by a plane. Think of like panes of glass that are same plane but farther forward or farther back Okay. So I've got another one of those that are... Now this one has a little different hue to it because it looks like it was made out of some different kind of brick slightly. You know, think of it, you're out in the desert and you're building up an adobe. They just go dig mud out of the ground. Sometimes it has different hues and stuff to it. So I got one area here that 
right here. And by the way, see these little little uh, posts sticking out? That's how adobes were made. You basically stack up bricks of adobe and you put rafters in before it's dry and uh, that creates your your horizontal structure across the across the walls. But I got myself an area here that's a little different color. I just laid some Naples yellow, raw Naples yellow, in on top of that other mixture because it, because I wanted to, and I think it's that's what I, the effect I was trying to get. There we go. So you can use your canvas kind of as a mixing point too. You don't have to mix everything in the palette, but that does have the the effect I wanted, more or less. But I went a little too far with the yellow, so I'm going to put some of my other mixture, just paint right over it. And it mixes right on canvas. That's kind of the idea that I have to share in here. And that goes right down here. Remember, we're not worrying about any detail yet. In some cases, I may never add a whole lot more detail than the kind that you see here. So this has some shadow stuff going on in it. They're not, they're good shadows. These are not spooky shadows, by the way. In case you, in case you ever read, oh, here's another little part of an old wall. It has that same color. And here. So remember, I'm not trying to get all the detail yet. I'm going to add detail, probably be in next week's session. Right now, though, I'm getting composition, light and dark, starting to work my colors. Yeah, I think we got the light areas done here. Matter of fact, so we switch gears and we go into the slightly darker parts of this painting. Again, referring to my swatches and my color scheme. I'm going to go raw umber, Naples yellow, and white to create the, the shadowy areas here. We'll just see. Don't know. Oh, that's a little too dark. It's like I was saying, it, it, pigments tend to come out darker when you get them on canvas as to, versus how they look on the palette. So i got to lighten that little area up a bit. I'm creating my little zones here of paint. Come back to them that way. Try that. Ah, we might be talking. Ha-ha! <laughs> Nailed it. I'm just freehanding it in today. Pretty steady hand. That's not always the case. Sometimes it's a little shaky or something. And that's when you can use your tape or a straight edge. But I did pencil it in beforehand. Another thing is don't, I mean, try to avoid using little teeny tiny brushes for the most part. Try to get it to where your brush let the brush do the work. 
get the right brush in your hand and just become proficient at letting the brush kind of do its thing instead of painting a thousand little strokes in there. These areas that I'm leaving will be darker yet. That I'm leaving uh, without any paint on them right now. Inspiration, composition, light and dark, and color. Those are the things that we think about. In that order, by the way. This is fun. Do a slightly smaller little chisel brush because I got some smaller areas to work on here. This one is about a quarter of an inch wide. Give you some scale here. Notice too that a lot of times you'll be working on the painting and there'll be wet areas of the paint, even with acrylics. So you can use your pinky to sort of give you some steady uh, steadiness of the brush here. If you don't have a pinky, perhaps lost through some accident or what have you, uh, you could use another device or perhaps you would even prefer it. A device could be something as simple, by the way, as another paintbrush, which you anchor here and you it gives you some uh, stability for your painting hand. See that? See what I'm doing there? I just have this held right against the painting with my left hand. Now I'm able to kind of control the brush better, rather than just trying to freehand it without any sort of anchor, I call it. All right. Yeah, you know, and I, I, I really empathize for people who are used to going out and eating at restaurants and going to sporting events and everything. And like all of us, we do some of that. But things have changed, and for a while here at least, we're going to have to figure out ways to occupy ourselves in some creative, hopefully, or at least fun fashion. Uh, and no better way to do it than hooking up on the live painting channel. Spread the word to your friends. I do that. I like this better than my pinky, actually. My other brush. The brush as a kind of a guide. You just put your other hand on it. All 
right. A lot of subtle lights and darks in this structure that I'm painting right now. And also remember that whenever you're dealing with a straight line of any sort like these windows, notice how they all follow essentially an almost parallel to the main structure here. But what they actually do is they actually converge at whatever your vanishing point is. That's a, a term you can research offline here. But vanishing point is where all of these perspective lines finally meet out here. Okay, and it'll be out here for some, somewhere in space. I guess you can't quite see that. But... Um, and just like these converge slowly towards the top, a little narrow at the top. And my point is, is that all of these other lines, like the windows, which are parallel more or less to the main structure, just keep that in mind. So those lines will be roughly parallel to the same line that's, uh, say, that same part of the structure. But if you really are into it, you start a tiny little bit of adjustment for the vanishing point effect. Has a has an important impact, I think, on how the the structure is perceived and when you're painting there. Just keep laying in this more darker shades here as we go. I got a healthy supply of that pigment uh, mix right here, and I'm able to just keep reproducing it by just adding more of the same pigments in roughly the same uh, increments there. So here we have a pretty big dark area. And this old adobe gets, has some crumbling edges, so it's really not intended to be perfectly straight everywhere. And as I work on this, I will crooked it up a little bit, even more probably. Remember, this is a uh, 110 years, 120 years old, something like that. All right, getting the gist of it? Ah, uh, yes. Building blocks today. Uh, building blocks. Here's a fun one. I'm just going to do freehand. This little angle right across here uh, is an old wall. Uh, it's... Uh, yeah, it's the wall, but it kind of looks like stair steps because the adobe bricks, the way they were struck, uh, stacked here, kind of a nice little effect. So it's going to be the same tone, the same dark color as the the other plane, which because it's on the same plane and it's in the shadow. In fact, it really extends all the way down here, doesn't it? Uh, the main uh, lesson here is to have fun, by the way. Just have fun. Don't get frustrated. I have referred to some of my art attempts as it's one, sometimes it's agony, sometimes it's ecstasy. But the main thing is don't stress out, have fun.
back to my bigger brush, about three eighths inch, because I got some ground to cover here. For now, I'll take some pretty loose painting here. Goodness, look at the time. Time flies when you're having fun on the live painting channel, doesn't it? All right. Oh, I just had a crazy thought. I don't know if any of you know who M.C. Escher is, famous painting uh, paint, uh, artist. He did a lot of woodcuts and carvings and been neat mostly, but uh, he used to make some really bizarre um, images where stairs that sort of were impossible and all kinds of cool stuff. I just had this thought of maybe doing one of these uh, like that. Oh, look, for some reason I got this big four here. Oh, that's kind of interesting. What would I do with that? Don't know. Just noticed it. Okay, a few other dark areas, and then we're going to start wrapping here for today. I've got a little kind of a garden wall here, and it has its own light and dark. We're just using the same basic colors, same basic material. And a little part of that wall back in here. Got some dark areas here. Light and dark. Color is kind of secondary, really, as you start getting into this. Composition, light and dark. There's going to be some foliage right in here. Looks like some cacti. At least that's what I got in mind. How come that's not moving? There we go. So, believe it or not, we are going to have some greens in here. So, I get my greens and blues, huh? I'm going to get my greens and blues out of this yet. There's going to be some foliage here, so I'm not getting any detail there. That four is tripping me out, man. How we made a four out of that. Look at that. All right. I'm going to just put apply a little bit of uh, dark, dark brown into 
do some of these window areas just so we kind of see how that's going to be looking. I better get my little grater here. Yeah, and don't forget about perspective if you're doing anything that has architectural elements or things of the same size repeating in the painting. You need your perspective. Maybe we'll do a little study on vanishing point and perspective one of these days, in case you're interested. And if you've just happened by, you've run across the live painting channel. This is Warren Stokes, the host. We're doing a painting of a Adobe Pueblo that I saw down in... Uh, Desert Hot Springs a couple weeks ago. Amazing place built by John Cabot. Started building it in 1913. He was a very well-known sort of pioneer of all sorts. Why he chose this area, I'm not sure, but they've discovered hot springs right on this area. And so this is in the town or near the town of Desert Hot Springs. Really wonderful. We went to a little hotel spa thing there. Very low key. Had seven different pools with different temperatures of water. It's right in this area. And the water is uh, supposedly, and I, could, I could believe it, very healing. Comes right out of the ground at about 105 degree temperature. And then they regulate different pools temperatures so people can have their choice. Really neat place. Uh, it was like $8 to, to spend all day there if you wanted. Really cool. Desert Hot Springs. That was called the Desert Hot Springs Spa, I think. And we, from there, about two miles away is this place. All right, cool. Hey, that's roughly the impression that I'm looking for. Nice. I love it when a plan comes together like that. We're the A-team right now. We're on the A-team.
Well, that brings us well over the top of the hour. Uh, it's been a fun hour or so of painting. And uh, got a good start on this guy. So I look forward to uh, meeting you all again uh, maybe next Sunday on the Live Painting Channel. My name is Warren Stokes, the host. You can find us on Facebook, Twitch, YouTube. Just search for Live Painting Channel. And join us uh, next Sunday at 11 a.m. Pacific Time, live. See you then. Bye now.